Welcome back, everyone, to the final session of the Plato Partnership Conference. Uh, we have two great papers for the final session, and the setup will be the same as all of the other academic sessions. So we'll have a 30-minute presentation, followed by a 10-minute discussion and five minutes for Q&A. And then after the two papers, there'll be an opportunity to go and join one of two breakout rooms where you can chat um, in person with the author and the discussant for the paper. So just a reminder, or for anyone who's joining this session for the first time, you can ask web chat questions during the session, which I will uh, read to the author at the end of the session. Um, you can do that if you're on a desktop by going to the top right of the screen. There'll be an ask a question button. Um, or if you're on a smartphone or smart device, you'll see on the left of your screen, there's a, a little button with three lines. Click on that and you'll find a ask a question button. Um, so with that housekeeping um, out of the way, let's move to the first paper presentation. Um, the paper is titled, Does Gamified Trading Stimulate Risk Taking? Um, and the presenter for the paper is Mariana Kapko. Mariana is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and also at the Swedish House of Finance. So over to you, Mariana. Thank you, Carol. Let me share my, my slides. Yes, hopefully everyone can see uh, the slides now. Yeah, we're all good. So um, what I will talk today uh, about is gamification and risk taking, right? So what happened uh, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, and we all remember this, we witnessed this jump in retail trading activity. And uh, the pandemic surge was driven by the shift in what has been happening, right, with work patterns, entertainment opportunities, and of course, doubled by this fear of missing out, right? Everyone was doing it, so I should be probably doing it too. But in fact, um, the retail volume uh, has been increasing um, over the last decade, and it was fueled by more um, structural changes, right, such as digitalization and decentralization of the asset management. And it has been steadily increasing uh, even before 2020. Um, uh, it more than doubled over the past decade. So now, uh, I don't know if you realize this, but as a group, retail traders are the second largest market segment after market makers and um, high frequency traders. So in particular, it's larger than quantitative investors, it's larger than hedge funds or bank affiliated uh, traders. So what happened um, also also very interestingly is that a lot of this retail trading was um, coming from social media based investors right and has also fueled the popularity of the mobile trading app Robinhood that you've all heard about leading to a meme, meme stock phenomenon and a very interesting pushback against the Wall Street something that we have not seen before as well but Importantly, as the competition on fees between the online broker reached the, the zero lower bound, they needed a way to differentiate themselves further and to attract traders. So they did the, that by offering investors, and this is what you see here, kind of a, a, a screenshot of, of the app, the opportunity to literally trade from the palm of your hand, right? And, uh, and have a sleek interface, have all these features like flashing bright colors, confetti. So the resulting trading environment became increasingly gamified, right? It was almost like you're playing a video game, but with your money, right? Trying to, to, to make investment decisions. And of course, we have to keep in mind as, as financial economists, um, what is the, the, the profit model here? And the goal of these retail training apps, particularly those involved in the payment for order flow, was now not just to maximize the number of, of uh, subscribers, but also to stimulate trading, to stimulate engagement with the play platform, the, the time that you spend, right, doing, um, doing your investment, not just the number of people who are investing with a particular app. And indeed, if you look, and this is what I have on this slide, if you look at the largest um, online brokers, the, the six, uh, Fidelity, Vanguard, and, and the others, Together, they have more than 100 million subscribers, uh, users combined, and the numbers for broker revenue from these payments for order flow are actually quite impressive, right? So this is what has been happening on one, on one hand, but on the other hand, there were also signs that making this investing more engaging and attractive more and more traders and having them spend more and more time on these platforms has been having some negative effects on investors, especially the younger novice investors for whom it was a completely new experience, not those that switched from investing at the brick and mortar institution with an advisor to an app, but those that started off with an app, right? And really treated it like a video game. 
So uh, at some point, there was a regulatory pushback. Uh, and in particular, this was coming from the Securities and, and Exchange Commission, uh, Gary Gansler. He uh, publicly raised concerns uh, about behavioral technology and gamification of training apps. Also, at some point in 2020, at the end of 2020, uh, Massachusetts, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, filed a formal administrative complaint against Robin, who's specifically um, quoting aggressive marketing that goes against investors' best interests. And, and, and they kind of have a list of all these gamification elements like confetti uh, and, and, and other things that, that were distracting and perhaps engaging investors in the wrong way. So uh, what, um, what we bring to, to the literature is a discussion on digital brokers and trader behavior. And uh, well, what has been done so far and what we know is that uh, there is some evidence or that push notifications increase investor attention, which, which might be a good thing, right? But they also increase leverage. Uh, investors make more uh, risky trades, take more risk if they are trading from the palm of the hand on their smartphones, as opposed to the desktop computers, which, which somehow puts people in, in a different mindset, right? And there is mixed evidence on, on performance. So um, what we do uh, here in this paper, we are asking the question um, whether the gamification of these trading apps exacerbates risk taking by individual traders. And we try to answer this question, uh, unlike these other works that, that I cited before, in a controlled experimental setting. Uh, so we introduced trading uh, gamification in an experiment. And there are a number of reasons why we chose an experiment, right? And, and the big one is, of course, that the traders tend to self-select themselves, right, into these apps. So there's, so, so there's the um, selection bias. And of course, there's extensive margin effect since COVID, right? So it would be hard to do it with the... Uh, uh, with the real apps and of course the the, the timing of these nudges and, and reminders and notifications and confetti is, is endogenous in practice who receives notifications when it's not exogenous so we look specifically at the intensive margin right does the gamification work as a nudge for those who, who already joined the platform and we build for that an online randomized online experiments to get around all these uh, endogeneity issues so uh, let me um, talk a little bit about the experimental setup. It's, it's actually very simple. It's very simple on purpose. Uh, and so let me walk you through this. So um, we have a single risky asset. It's a virtual stock. It's traded over nine trading rounds. And at the start of each round, the participant, uh, participant is endowed with the unit of that asset, which she can sell at any time. So the asset prices and participant payoffs are a standard denominated in experimental dollars. So you will see here like E dollar, this is experimental dollar, which is artificial lab currency. And we later convert it to Canadian dollars and to make payments to participants at the end of experiment. So the beginning of each round, the asset price is 10 experimental dollars. And then during the round, the price updates every two seconds with certain probability, and this is pi here, the market can crash. So then the price reaches zero and the round ends. That's it, game, game end. Um, otherwise, with the complementary probability, the price can increase either by $1, $2 or remain unchanged. And these three non-crash outcomes are equally likely. Okay, so this is what's happening with the price. In terms of the decision-making, participants' only choice is whether and when to sell the asset. So this is on purpose made very, very simple, the, the, um, the decision set. So essentially, it's an optimal stopping problem in which we can adapt the, um, the bomb risk elicitation test. So this is the, the test um, used to elicit risk preferences in the finance literature by Crusato and Philippine. We adapt, adapt this to finance uh, setting. And there is a time limit, uh, meaning that each round lasts at most uh, a minute, uh, which means that you have 30 price updates, right? And if participants sell the asset before the time limit, then the payoff is the selling price. If she holds the asset until the end, um, then they get the payoff equal to the price at the end of the round. And if the market crashes, of course, and they don't sell, the payoff is zero. So these are kind of the rules of the game. So the only decision is, is, is whether and when um, to sell. 
So uh, in terms of, let me mention one more thing, in terms of the payment, so we choose a, a trading run at random, which is the payment run, and participants know about this. Um, they're also at the end asked to um, answer a number of questions on financial literacy, and this will be an important part of, of our results, and they are rewarded for correct answers. So across these nine rounds, we vary two things. Okay, so once again, fairly simple. We vary the market crash probability, trying to mimic a low and high risk environment, which is difference in the risk of the environment to proxy for a riskiness of the asset that people are trading in, in real life. And we also, uh, we also vary whether the platform is gamified or not. And we allocate people to these two blocks and the block A uh, trades on the gamified platform first. And block B first trades on the non-gamified kind of standard, and you will see exactly how the platform looks like, and then they move on to the gamified. Uh, the first round is a training round, and it's non-gamified for everyone. Uh, we randomize also the crash probability to avoid any kind of learning, um, learning effects. So um, the key design feature of our experiment is whether the training platform, which is basically the screen that you see when you trade, whether it's gamified or not. And I haven't I said exactly what we mean by gamification yet, or I gave you some examples. What we mean is a set of these user experience design elements that aim to promote your engagement with the platform, including behavioral prompts and game-like features, okay? So what this figure shows you is a typical screen of the non-gamified platform. What participants see is just a few things. So it's plain and simple. They see the asset price, they see the value of the crash probability, the SPI that I introduced before, and they see the graph in indicating the price dynamic within the round. They can also revisit instructions at any time, and they can sell the asset by clicking the sell button, and we ask them to confirm their action. So they, they're also able to click sell, and then we ask, are you sure about your choice, and they can back out if, if they want to. So uh, now the gamified uh, design includes the same information. So in terms of information content, we keep it the content, we keep it the same. In particular, we don't alter the, the price graphics and, and the sell button, but we make the current price at the crash probability more salient by changing the color scheme. And what they can also see is the achievement badges for spending a certain amount of time um, with the game uh, without selling. And these yet to be earned badges are always visible in the top of the screen in black and white. They're sort of locked. And when you spend a certain time, they get unlocked and you get a notification that congratulations, um, you've earned a certain badge. There is confetti uh, going down the, street, uh, the screen. In addition to these badges, we show them encouragement messages and animations at other fixed times. And they appear as these kind of speech blurbs from a trading mascot, which in this case, we chose to be Scrooge McDuck. So these are meant to kind of proxy for the push notifications that you get from the app saying, you haven't logged in for a certain amount of time. Do you want to check on your investment? Things like that. And, and this screen shows you what happens if you earn this achievement, the badge is briefly displayed along with the congratulation message. Um, and, and this message is drawn and random. The language of these messages, we chose to be inspired by the, the, um, uh, the language of the Wall Street Bats forum, the Reddit forum, which has been kind of prominent uh, in, in the pandemic. So we included also the emoji sequences such as diamond hands or hold strong, which seem to be fitting here because the question is about when to sell or how long to, how long to hold. So now in terms of our participants, um, we recruited them uh, from Prolific which is an online subject pool uh, specifically targeted, specifically catering to academic research. We pre-select participants based on three criteria, fluency in English, uh, residents in Anglophone countries, we want them to be coming from countries where they're well-developed securities market, and past investment experience. So these are people that have invested before and not necessarily with these online trading apps and, and not necessarily being actively involved in training. You will see, the, I will show you some statistics on the trading experience, but they must have had past investment experience. So with an advisor, for example, with their bank. Um, so in total, we have uh, more than 600 subjects from US, Canada, UK, and Australia. Uh, and the sample, as you can see here um, from kind of the composition, is, is relatively gender biased. Age-wise, the median um, and modal participants were 37, 27 years old. So um, in, in, in the total sample, the age ranged between 18 and 77. Um, so it, it was a good cross section by comparison the average age of Robinhood users is 31 so we think kind of on the in terms of the um 
average participant, we are uh, close to, to that population. It's, the sample is biased towards higher educated participants. And so it's something to keep in mind. So there is uh, more than 45%, 47% reporting some sort of graduate education, either masters or MBA or doctorate degree. Uh, two thirds of the sample reported they have significant training experience and um, three quarters trade mostly stocks. But interestingly, almost 18% are trading cryptocurrencies. So this is kind of a, a, a new sample, I would say, something that we would not see uh, just a few years ago. And we also asked participants uh, about their training habits. And almost a third of a sample checks their portfolio at least once a day, with on the other end, 32% of participants checking the portfolio um, less than once a month. Okay, so here again, we have a, a big variation here. So um, since the experiment is, is, is fairly simple, in terms of the variables that we look at, there are just two variables to pay attention to, right? So the dependent variables that you want to, to see how they vary between the two designs. So one is uh, the price at which the participants sell the asset. And uh, the other one is the time that elapsed until the decision to, to sell. So this, in this table, I'm showing you average levels of the two variables across the two platforms conditional on the round, of course, um, ending with a selling decision. And we see that indeed participants spend more time in gamified rounds before selling the asset and they sell at higher prices just from this kind of eyeballing the, um, the summary stats. And both effects seem to be relatively large in rounds with the higher risk of market crash. So now you might be wondering, you, you, you talked a lot about gamification. What about risk conversion? How do you map this into risk conversion? And, and so this is the approach that we take. We assume that participants are risk conversed with the standard kind of constant relative risk conversion preferences here, right? And then we can pin down with this assumption, we can pin down the optimal selling price because it's determined by this equation that you see here, which is, says nothing else that the expected utility of waiting until the next step should be equal to the expected utility of selling um, uh, at, at the optimal price level, okay? And so this means that the optimal selling price solves this equation and we can use this to characterize the optimal solution. Intuitively, uh, and, and this is, should be something uh, easy, easier to grasp than perhaps equations and derivatives here, more risk tolerant participants will spend more time at the trading platform and they will sell the asset at higher prices because you see that the asset price is actually weakly increasing with time. So further, the impact of the shift in, in risk preferences on the selling prices will be larger. And this is what we expect from mathematically uh, from, from the economics of the problem. The impact of the shift will be larger if market crash uh, is more likely. So this is what you see in the, in, in the last bullet point here. Uh, one thing that I want to note before I start showing you the results is that we also need to keep in mind that the data that we have will be censored, right? Because for rounds that randomly end with a crash, we never observe how long the participants would wait and, and at which price they would sell the asset. So to account for the center, we will be estimating a token model. So we're trying to be careful here with the, with the chronometrics. We also do robustness with the standard uh, OLS. Okay, so now, in terms of the hypothesis, um, what do we expect? So if gamification indeed increases participants' risk tolerance, the first uh, three predictions uh, that we have here is um, about the higher prices in the gamified environment, about the selling the asset later, so waiting long, being engaged longer right, with the platform, and finally more likely, and this comes from the first two, more likely to experience a, a market crash. So basically the main conjecture is that these gamified training platforms nudge participants to take a larger risk. And this conjecture draws on the emerging literature in psychology right, that actually documents that affective processes impact your risk-taking behavior. So, so you can shift your preferences depending what you see on, on the screen and you can behave differently. Uh, so effectively, basically, they, what, we, what we are wondering about and what we will test, whether the, those that trade on gamified platforms act as if they had a lower effective relative risk conversion. So these are our first three hypotheses. I will introduce a few more later, but let's, let's look at the results. 
So we find empirical supports for hypothesis one. And here you basically can look at the first draw, right, at the gamified um, dummy here. So indeed, participants sell the asset at a higher price in the gamified environment. And uh, we need to be a bit careful interpreting the effects here. It's a nonlinear model, but doing the computation from the average marginal effect, we see that the, it corresponds to about 6.3% relative premium over the average non-gamified uh, selling price. And if we map this into risk conversion, as I explained earlier, it leads to a 6% increase in the risk tolerance coefficient. It might seem like not much, but actually this is economically significant. We show in the paper that basically, if you're thinking about riskier and riskier bets, then these 6% map into quite high increases in certainty equivalent, right? And certainty equivalent is this kind of safe return that you would uh, accept instead of participating in the bet. So depending on the environment, these 6% kind of gets amplified and leads to more risk-taking behavior in more and more riskier environments. A few other results to note, we kind of confirmed that our participants indeed behave as, as risk averse agents would behave because they respond to changes in the probability of market crash. So you see the high risk having a negative coefficient here. And if you just look at the first column, this includes all the controls here. So in rounds with high crash risk, they indeed sell um, the asset for a lower price and then in low um, risk rounds and consistent with the literature, let me just mention this, that men are marginally less risk averse than women, although this is not kind of the main thing that, that we're testing here. This table provides um, evidence for hypothesis two. Uh, instead of the selling price, we hear instrument risk conversion with the timing of the sell decision. And as I mentioned, since price weekly increases with time, we expect more risk averse participants to optimally sell earlier and more risk tolerant participants to sell uh, later. And this is what we find consistent with the drop in risk conversion in gamified um, platforms. And of course, so this is the testing the third hypothesis where we uh, dependent variable is the market crash indicator. A natural consequence, if you delay to sell, uh, you are more likely to experience a market crash, right, in, in our game. So, and, and this is uh, this was our hypothesis three. And indeed, if we estimate a linear probability model, we find that the probability of observing a market crash jumps. It's an 11% jump. If you look at this 3% compared to, uh, to unconditional crash probability, it's 11% jump. In, in probability of experience that crash. So gamification increases the likelihood um, that um, the participants basically end the round with nothing, right? They, 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 earn their, um, they earn zero in that round. One thing that we're thinking about is, um, of course, and one concern that, that you might have listening to me is that basically this gamified treatment uh, makes players delay selling because they're simply distracted by all these features, the messages, the confetti, the badges, rather than due to the shift of risk preferences. So if that was the case, we would expect the impact of gamification on the selling price and uh, on the time spent to be independent of the probability of the market crash. If they're distracted, they would behave the same in these environments. If on the other hand, it indeed has an effect on the risk aversion and shift the preferences, we would expect that the impact of gamification, as I showed you from this kind of um, discussion on risk conversion, it should be larger in rounds with higher probability of the market crash and riskier rounds. And this is exactly our hypothesis for. And in line with this hypothesis, so here we, again, we look at the exit price, that's my dependent variable. And uh, the most important uh, are the first two rows. And we can focus on the first column here because that's, that's the one that has um, all the controls. So we find um, that the selling price uh, almost doubles in rounds with higher pressure risk. So again, um, we need to interpret these coefficients carefully because these are Tobit nonlinear, but we look at the, at the average marginal effects. So we have more than doubling of the sec uh, selling price. Um, in low risk environments, they sell the asset for 0 0.73 um, dollars or experimental dollars, and it's 1.8 in, in gamified environment. So this result suggests that they do encourage risk taking, particularly these types of platforms, these types of features, particularly for highly volatile asset classes, right? This is how we're thinking in terms of mapping this crash probability that for highly volatile asset classes, such as leveraged derivative products, and this is what we've seen, as well as cryptocurrencies, um, where the risk of substantial losses is the highest. And it seems that this is kind of where the risk taking is um, increasing the most. So now, um, 
let me um, focus on the last kind of hypothesis that we have regarding the cross-sectional effects. And I mentioned financial literacy before, it will come into play here. So um, what we know is um, now the, from the evidence is that these trading platforms, these features, perform as behavioral nudges to encourage more risk taking, particularly in environment, environments with high volatility. But the question is, how does the magnitude uh, of this effect vary in the cross-section? So there are two things that we look at in these hypotheses. One is financial literacy, whether the intensity of the nudge is weaker if you, if you kind of have more finance background and you actually know more of what you're doing or know more about the field that, uh, that you're trying to, um, to enter here. And the second is experience in playing the game. Right, so sort of began comparing, mapping this in real life to more novice investors versus more experienced investors. And so what we um, have here, uh, what I want to show you is the distribution of the financial literacy quiz scores. Uh, so you remember we, at the end of the experiment, we ask everyone kind of a standard uh, 11 questions um, on financial literacy. And the average quiz scores are actually quite high. So it's again, perhaps corresponding to people having higher education here. They are quite correlated, which is very uh, reassuring to us who teach finance. They are highly correlated with having taken a, a formal course in finance. So that's good news. And the average score increases to 8.1 for those, as opposed to 3. Point, uh, sorry, 7.3 for um, total average. And to a lower extent, uh, it is um, correlated with uh, having a real life training experience. So the big advice here, uh, go take a formal finance course if you haven't done so, if you want to, if you want to trade. And uh, this figure summarizes the effect of the literacy. So the main thing to look at on these two graphs, so what I have is the selling price on the y-axis, crash probability on the x-axis. And uh, on the left, I have below average uh, literacy. And on the right, I have above average literacy. The different columns of the bars correspond to gamified versus non-gamified platforms. And the main thing to look at is the gap. Okay, between the orange and, 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 and the blue bar. And you see that um, for both, regardless of the crash probability, basically this gap is considerably narrower for participants with higher levels of financial literacy. This is what you see in the right panel. So these results suggest that if you have a strong grasp of finance concepts, you're not so susceptible, right, to, to be swayed by these non-monetary gamification elements. And, and it highlights, and, and this is what you want to emphasize, the importance of financial education for successfully navigating these trading platforms. And um, finally, um, here, uh, we provide some support for in-game uh, trading experience. So the hypothesis six. So what we look at here is whether, again, the outcome variable is the exit price. We also do this for the time to sell. And um, we look at whether you were in this block A or block B, meaning whether you first experienced gamified environment and then switched to non-gamified, kind of the plain simple, or the other way around. So we leverage our experimental design uh, in, in, because we split participants half half. And so uh, what we see here is that indeed the uh, impact of gamification is much, much higher. It's basically the results are coming from those who experienced gamified rounds first, right? This is what you see in the in the first estimate here in the first draw, first, first column. So they're almost three and a half times stronger for those who were exposed to the gamified rounds at the beginning. And so the way we interpret this is that um, if we extrapolate this, we argue that beginners are more likely to be influenced, right? By these gamified trading platforms. It, in the experiment, it was very, very clear that people who saw first the simple platform and understood what they're supposed to do for a couple of rounds and then switched to platform featuring all these behavioral nudges and behavioral prompts didn't really pay my, much attention to those. But those who, who were kind of immediately introduced to the, um, to the nudges and to the game-like um, game-like elements, they were much more exposed uh, and, and, and took a higher risks. So um, this is um, what I had today. Uh, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm good in terms of time and Carol nods, so that's great. So let me kind of sum up. I, I hope I didn't, um, didn't rush too much, but the experiment itself is fairly simple. Remember, it's a kind of an optimal selling decision, right? And we're just varying the design here. So we recruited a lot of people, more than 600 participants across uh, from, from all over the world, right? We did this online. And the participants um, took more risk on platforms that featured gamified elements, right? And we tried to 
to mimic those elements and to, to have them correspond to what you really see in the training apps like Robinhood and others. It's not just Robinhood that introduces all these, uh, you know, congratulatory messages, nudges, badges, and things like that. There are actually quite a few and uh, that do that more and more, I would say. And the effect was stronger, and this is an important result, uh, on the assets that are ex ante more risky. Right, and, and this was consistent with the um, gamification reducing risk conversion. Very importantly, the effect was moderated by financial literacy and trading experience, which is good news, right? So this is something that policymakers can take into account. And um, when it comes to financial literacy, one standard deviation increase in the literacy score reduced the impact of, of more than 50%. It's, so it's, it's quite a significant effect here. Thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much, Mariana. Your timing is perfect. Um, so our discussant for this paper is Deborah Maloso, who's from the Toulouse Business School. So over to you, Deborah. Thank you very much, Carol. And I will share my screen. Okay. Can you see this? We can. Thank you. Perfect. So thanks a lot for the opportunity to discuss this paper that I think is on a topic that is obviously very important. So Mariana already spent some time motivating the importance of this, but uh, I think it's one of the important issues nowadays in household finance, definitely to talk, to think about uh, this problem. I'm going to be um, giving my comments and going and reviewing the paper both together. Okay. So as I, as I review a little bit the paper, I will give uh, comments for each part. All right, so uh, this is an experiment uh, with uh, gamified trade. Um, it's a lab experiment, even though um, it's a large sample taken online, it's lab because the situation, people are embedded in the situation that is created by the experimentalist. There's no other situation around it. Uh, a few great features about the experiment. Well, first of all, doing an experiment is a good thing here because randomization as opposed to self-selection into the gamified apps, very important. Um, the, the large sample that they have uh, filtered uh, correctly and um, very diverse on certain dimensions, very nice. And the pre-registered pre design, which is kind of the standard nowadays, and um, it's becoming our good practice. Finally, um, the sample of participants on some dimensions, at least, is similar, is arguably similar to what we see on some of the apps some of the most popular apps such as uh, Robinhood. Now, what are we asking here? Or what, I'm not asking it, well, what are, are the authors asking? What is the effect of gamification on some investor behaviors? Which one? They chose risk, uh, risk taking. However, perhaps my first question is why risk taking only uh, when we could care about gamification effect on bankruptcy? less reliance on good advice, more making of mistakes. There are so many things that you could have asked or even positive outcomes, right? That gamification might have had on investors overall. There's a focus on risk taking that is measured in two ways, higher stopping time and higher stopping price. And of course, also higher uh, likelihood of ban bankruptcy, which is a consequence of this. Okay, um, the experimental task is the bomb risk elicitation task uh, of Crozetta and Philippine the dynamic version of it and modified, okay? So very quickly, the bomb risk elicitation test, you can see here the little graph of the classical bread. Uh, you have a bunch of squares that are uncovered. Here are actually 100 squares to start with. As time passes, those squares get covered every two seconds, for example. Uh, they are covered and the participant just has to choose when to stop. The, there's two things about the original bomb risk elicitation task. Um, the price always increases with certainty, unlike in the modified version. And the second thing is the participant actually does not know if the bomb was behind one of the squares that have already been covered. Okay? So they're not aware if it has already happened that the bomb exploded. In the modified bread that is used in this experiment, there are two changes, one of them to adapt it to finance to make it more exciting, of course, the price doesn't increase for sure, right? Uh, either there's a crash or perhaps the bomb, the, the price increases, it stays the same, it increases by one or it increases by two, right? It makes it more interesting. 
But I think even more importantly, one big difference is that participants are aware at every moment in time that the bomb has not yet uh, exploded. Okay. I have a little bit double checked the calculations in the paper. I think everything holds true, but I was puzzled by uh, this little change introduces a non-stationarity in the problem that wasn't there before. And uh, I was surprised to see that the authors still made the comparison of only stopping right now versus continuing only for one period when in fact there's many other strategies right you could have compared stopping right now with continuing one period and continuing two periods if the price increases by one only there's many other strategies to compare to why only this two strategy comparison is enough to to identify the correct stopping price i'm almost sure it is it goes through however i, I wanted to see this in the paper uh, just the theoretical aside. Now, uh, gamification, and I think here are my, my main comments are going to come here. Um, there's a few things that are done. Badges are given for the time survived without a crash or a quit. Participants know in the screen that um, how many badges they can still obtain. I didn't understand, it wasn't clear to me in the paper whether they knew how much time to the next badge. That was something that uh, I, I, I wasn't sure they knew. Uh, another part of gamification is that they, they get cheering for good choices, well, way to go, or high risk tolerance, nerves of steel. So they actually stimulate it directly for having resisting the temptation of quitting. And there's graphics and language, great, taken from true apps and the investor forums. My concern is that um, in, as an experimental design, subjects seem to be almost instructed to stay longer time in the game. Okay, or which is equivalent to displaying higher risk tolerance. So uh, this may still be very relevant if uh, real gamified apps are rewarding exactly for that. And I think Mariana mentioned quickly that they do ga um, gamify staying in the game, but I could imagine some apps actually gamifying other things, the number of transactions, giving rewards for number of transactions or the performance of your portfolio, et cetera. Um, if that's the case, well, I don't see the mapping from this gamification into your risk aversion being very clear if you're directly rewarding people to stay longer in the game. Okay? In particular, um, I can think of gamification as a direct non-monetary payoff to staying long in the game. Okay? That changes the breadth. It's no longer a risk elicitation task. Uh, you, you're going against induced uh, preferences principle and the bread is no longer correctly eliciting people's risk conversion. The gamified bread is no longer a risk elicitation task, in my opinion. Um, all right, and then finally results. So um, what I just said is gonna link very strongly to interpretation of results. In the gamified treatment, so first result in the gamified treatment, participants stopped at higher price later, and they're likelier to experience a crash, H1, H2, H3. Um, gamification has a larger effect when crash risk is higher and uh, it correlates with uh, financial literacy and uh, experience in trading. So um, first comment on the interpretation of results. If results uh, one, I, I, I would hesitate before interpreting as an increase of risk tolerance. Okay? It could be a simple reaction to the non-monetary rewards that are given in the game, in the experiment to staying longer and nothing to do with increased risk tolerance. Um, second, I would have liked to see more of a separation between the time and the price result. I think there's a lot to learn from that. Okay? So uh, in particular, uh, the price, the, the, the derivation, the theoretical derivations are on price, not on time. Okay? So imagine that you had some draws that are particularly bad where people stay a long time in the game and they're getting batches, but the price didn't go up. Will they stay longer until the price goes up? Things like that, uh, I would have loved to see them, to separate, to interpret better the results. And also a little bit more exploitation of, uh, of uh, two and three, um, the effect of uh, financial literacy and this cross effect of risk, um, the moderating effect of riskiness. Um, it could help uh, disentangle whether people are making mistakes, whether it's the non-monetary rewards for time or whether it's risk tolerance that is being affected by gamification. That's it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Deborah. Um, 
Before we go to questions, I might give um, Mariana a moment to briefly respond um, and a reminder to everyone that you can uh, send in questions via the Q&A on the top right of your screen. But uh, Mariana, over to you first. Yes, thank you very much, Deborah, for your discussion. All the points very well taken. They, they, many of them come um, very closely to how, how we're thinking. You know, we we started with this simple design. We can strip off a lot of things, but now we're moving in the direction that indeed might perhaps not just risk taking. Right, there are other things <laughs> that you're interested in, and uh, so all the points very well taken. I hope I can, I, I could be able to send you a revised version uh, uh, to take a look because a lot of the things is something that we we are now trying to uh, to implement when kind of moving forward with the with the project. Thank you so much for your time and for your comments. Um, so a question for you, Mariana. If I'm a policymaker, um, what what's my takeaway from your paper in terms of uh, is should I be taking some action on gamification, or is everything okay? You know, that's a that's a very good question. And as I mentioned, some action has already been taken. But for instance, let me give you a, a, an example how how the industry responded. So there was uh, after this Massachusetts um, complaint about confetti, Robin Hood took away confetti. But what they, what they did, they replaced it with flowing geometrical figures that, well, they look exactly like confetti to me, right? But strictly speaking, kind of in the court of law, that they, they took some action. So, so there is uh, there, there might be a bit of a pushback, right? Because as I mentioned, we already reached the zero lower bond on fees and we need to differentiate with something, right? So this is where, where these um, game-like designs came in. But I think something that we can do and, 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 um, and this speaks to this financial literacy and trading experience designs, right? Uh, trading experience results that I talked about is kind of introduce and, and, and push the, um, the brokers to, um, to pay more attention to that, right? Perhaps, I don't know, require, you know, answer certain questions before you can actually trade or have a simple course available to the traders. And so, so things like that. So this is where regulators, right? Pushing on financial literacy of traders, because as we've seen a more, uh, you know, a trader that is more, either more experienced with the game, so to speak, or the, 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 the trading process, or is more aware of, of, of uh, you know, how finance actually works, uh, is not so susceptible to these things, right? So I think this is where regulators can have a big impact, right? Where it might be hard to, to push the companies to take away all these, um, all these practices and all these game-like elements. Thank you for the question. Terrific. Terrific. Thank you very much.